hello. Welcome to the first part of our unit on magnetism. In this unit, we're going to introduce the basics of magnetism. Uh, and we're going to begin by a little story. Uh, I don't know the actual truth of this story, but it is kind of fun. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a trip to ancient Asia Minor. And in ancient Asia Minor, as shown on the map here, there is a region called Magnesia. And the story goes that in Magnesia, in ancient Asia Minor, which by the way is modern day Turkey, um, there was a shepherd by the name of Magnus who was sitting around and watching the sheep. And while there, he happened to pick up two rocks and he noticed that depending on how he oriented the rocks, sometimes they would attract, sometimes they would repel. And thus, magnets were discovered. Okay, now, as I said, how true is this story? Well, it is true that if we go to ancient Asia Minor, we can find the land of Magnesia. And it is also true that there are rocks known as lodestones which are naturally occurring uh, naturally occurring permanent magnets but whether whether it was actually a shepherd named magnus that discovered this that seems a little bit too pat to me so in this uh this particular part of this unit we're going to answer the following questions so do you think these are true magnets have two ends or edges or faces or whatever word you want there. These ends are referred to as positive and negative, or these ends are called poles. Unlike poles repel, like poles attract, um, and a compass needle is a magnet. To begin our investigation, we're going to look at this simulation. It runs in browser, but it requires um, chirp J to work, which may or may not happen. So here it is. Um, so as you can see in the, the simulation, we have a bar magnet and we have a compass. We also have an array of, uh, what looks like compass needles behind the bar magnet. And if I move the bar magnet, those compass needles reorient. And if you look, particularly up here, for example, as you move further away from the bar magnet, the array in the background gets dimmer, indicating that there is less strength. On the other hand, if you look near the bar magnet, they're brightest, indicating that's areas where the magnetic field is strongest. Notice in the middle, it gets dimmer. So this field strength at the middle of the magnet is not as strong as at these two ends. You'll also notice that the ends are labeled N and S. That's because they're referred to as the north and south poles of the bar magnet. You will see on the little array behind that the red ends are attracted to the south pole and the white ends are attracted to the north pole. I can bring in the compass and you can see again, red is attracted to white and white is attracted to red. And you can't get it to reorient. This is because opposites attract, likes repel. Okay, so I'm going to minimize this and bring this back in. The other thing you may have noticed there was that the magnetic field seemed to form a loop around the magnet. So I'm going to draw schematically, in theory, what I mean here. Here we go. So if I had my bar magnet with the north end on this side and the south pole on that side, then the magnetic field kind of came out and did this. What you couldn't tell from the, the simulation is the directionality. And by convention, we say that the magnetic field lines come out of the North Pole 
and go into the south pole. So this one would be oriented like this. If I drew another one out of north into south. The symbol for magnetic field is the letter B. Okay, I know. So there's some history there, which I actually just recently learned that Maxwell, when he was working on his formalism of magnetism, called the first thing A, the second thing B, and so on and so forth. So this ended up being B. Um, but the other issue here is that M is taken. M is almost universally mass, and we wouldn't want the confusion between M for magnetic field and M for mass. The unit for the magnetic field that we will be using is the Tesla, abbreviated capital T. Okay, so here are some depictions of the magnetic field due to a bar magnet again. You can see a schematic similar to the one that I drew on the last page. You can also see a picture here of the bar magnet. In the background, you can see iron filings, and they're very, very attracted to the poles, but not many are stuck in the middle. That is consistent with what we saw in the simulation, that the magnetic field gets weaker in the middle of the magnet. You can also see these compasses aligning along the arc formed by the iron filings in the background. That is also this arc shown schematically. Okay. We've answered this already. Where is the magnetic field due to a bar magnet strongest? It's at the poles. How can we tell by looking at the field lines? I'm going to back up one slide. So here is where the field is strongest. Here is where it's weakest. As with electric fields, there are more field lines present where the field is strongest. So, so more lines means bigger field. Here is a horseshoe magnet, so a slightly different orientation. It's almost like they've taken a bar magnet and folded it around. And again, you can see lots of filings uh, stuck to the poles, not much in between in both pictures. Here we have two bar magnets doing two very different patterns, but again, analogous to what we saw with the electric fields. When I see a null in between, that means my magnetic poles have uh, are the same. And here I'm seeing what looks like lines connecting the two poles, and that's because they're opposite. So now let's think about the Earth, because the Earth does have a magnetic field. So I'm going to go back to the simulation and show planet Earth. If you take a bar magnet or a compass, the end of the compass needle that is the north magnetic pole will point towards north on Earth. This is again a bit of history because they named the poles, realizing that they aligned with what was going on with the Earth, before they realized opposites attract and likes repel. So they, they named the end of the, the compass that pointed towards the north, the north end of the compass. But that means that magnetic north, or the, let me say this again, the magnetic pole that is near geographic north is actually magnetic south. And the opposite is true as well. Currently, the magnetic pole that is closest to geographic south pole is magnetic north. But keep in mind that this is not how this has been throughout history. Um, the magnetic poles move around quite dramatically in times. And 
they've actually flipped and we can see the record of the changes in orientation of the Earth's magnetic field in the rock record. Using that record, we can determine roughly the timing between when flips occur. The bad news is that a flip is overdue. The good news is that we're talking geologic timescales, and so by saying overdue, that means it might occur in the next 100,000 years. So not much to worry about there. Okay. So in electricity, one of the first things we discussed was the fact that I can take electrons and I can separate them from, from the corresponding proton out of an atom. I can even move it onto two separate objects, take it from here to here. Can I separate a north magnetic pole from a south magnetic pole? And the answer is no. Okay. So for example, if I have a bar magnet, north on this end, south on this end, and I cut it in two and separate it so that now where I had one chunk of metal before, now I have two chunks of metal. What I will end up with is two separate bar magnets. And I will have four poles now instead of having two separate poles. We've discussed how north attracts south, south attracts north, north repels north, south repels south. What if you have something that isn't a magnet? So for example, if I have a bar magnet again, why a bar magnet? Because they're easy to draw. And then I have a paper clip. Hopefully you've all seen how paper clips can be attracted to bar magnets, but the paper clip on its own is not a magnet. So much like with electricity, we can have induced attractions. What happens is the field, the magnetic field due to the bar magnet causes the atoms maybe in the paper clip to align such that a north end, a north magnetic end forms near this south end and a corresponding south on the other end. And now we have an induced attraction. Um, the best understanding of what is actually happening here is if I were to go and look inside a chunk of material that can be magnetized, so maybe like a piece of iron. What happens is you get these domains. And on these domains, the electrons circle, kind of. And they do it in such a way that they all kind of line up. And this comes down to now we have electrons that are moving. And one of the really cool pieces of the theory of electricity and magnetism that we're really not going to touch much on for this class is the fact that electric currents can form magnetic fields. As soon as those electrons start kind of all moving together, they form an electric current, which forms the magnetic field. And putting a piece of magnetic material near a, a bar magnet can cause this in that magnetic material to happen depending on how strong the field is and how long the the paper clip sits in that magnetic field will determine whether or not this becomes a permanent situation so that you have a permanently magnetized magnetic field. Okay, so magnets have two ends. Yes, they have at least two ends. They could have four they could have six, they could have eight, but they always appear in, in pairs. 
The ends are referred to as positive and negative. No, they are the north and south poles. Unlike poles repel, no, like poles repel, and unlike poles attract. So this comes back to opposites attract, likes repel. And a compass needle is a magnet? Yes, it is. Just as we did with electricity, we can divide the world up into magnetic and non-magnetic materials. However, there are many fewer types of material that can form a permanent magnet compared to materials that can conduct. In the main part of the periodic table, there are three elements that can form permanent magnets. Iron is probably known to you. The other are nickel and cobalt. And non-magnetic is pretty much everything else. Okay, so remember for steel that iron is the basis of steel. Some steels are magnetic, some are not. And it depends on how the um, steel is structured, if you will. There are a couple of other materials that can become permanent magnets. And these are down in the rare earth portion of the periodic table. If you're dealing with a rare earth magnet, those are the ones that look like this. So this is a rare earth magnet. One of these, a kind of typical bar magnet or um, horseshoe magnet, this is most likely iron or steel. Okay, those are permanent magnets. Are those the only way that we can create a magnetic field? And hopefully you're shouting in your head here the answer of no, it is not the only way because we can create um, electromagnets. And that will be the start of, of the next unit.